Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You're welcome again to another time with the Lord, another time of um, Bible studies. And today I want to examine, uh, well, I call it a, an interesting topic. Uh, this is a, a saying that most preachers will be familiar with, especially if you are a, a true gospel preacher. You will be very familiar with this phrase. Thou shall not judge. Don't judge. You are being judgmental. Today, in today's message, we want to examine the topic, Thou shall not judge. Did the Bible really say, Thou shall not judge? And what does it mean to judge? Let us go to the Lord in praise. In Jesus' name, Amen. Heavenly Father, King of glory, our Lord and our God, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity again to study your word. Mighty God, as we examine, O oh God, my Father, your word, O oh God, even at this hour, we pray that you will minister to us. We pray that you will speak to us. We pray that you will change the understanding of men, even as they hear or as they listen to this message all over the world in the name of Jesus. Let wisdom and understanding come upon the hearer. In the name of Jesus, thank you, precious Father. I give myself to you, O God, that you will pass through me, O God, and speak of this message the way you would want to teach it. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' gracious name, I pray. Amen and amen and amen. Yes, so today I want to examine the topic titled, Thou shall not judge. Thou shall not judge. If you often preach the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, you would often hear the phrase, don't judge. You are being judgmental, or the likes of it. Many preachers at this sound or at, the accusi at these accusations tend to become defensive and often get into what I call the damage control. Oh no, honey, I am not judging you. And you know the rest of it and they try to make amends and you know, correct their ways and or make the, 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 the hearer to feel good or to defend the case and the case become all about defending i'm not judging i'm not being judgmental i'm only you know and they get into that however the question that ensues or what the questions we should be asking or the questions we should be asking are these one are true gospel preachers really guilty of judgment passed on them by their hearers so when their hearers pass the judgment on them you are being judgmental don't judge are those preachers really guilty two have these true gospel preachers really done any damage or wrong to the hearers have they really wronged the hearers that is the second thing we want to examine and the third is how should a preacher handle these judgments from the hearers? How should a preacher handle this judgment from the hearers? And thirdly, oh sorry, that's third, and then the fourth, did the Bible really say, thou shalt not judge? Because that's where the whole thing matters. That is the bottom line. That is the conclusion of the whole matter. Because it doesn't matter what the preacher thinks or what the hearer thinks. What that really matters is what does the Bible say? Did the Bible, did the Holy Scriptures say, Thou shalt not judge? So, we want to scripturally uh, examine this saying, Thou shalt not judge, in this lesson. So the first question is, what does it mean to judge? When you say to judge someone, or you say thou shalt not judge, or when you say someone is being judgmental, the question that ensues is this, to better understand how to tackle this is, what does it really mean when you judge, or when you say the word judge? What does the word judge mean? Now, most times when people hear judge, judgment, the first view or the first view it from the perspective of a noun, that is 
the judge in the court and in relations to his or her duties in passing out legal judgments on someone. So when we want to hear the word judge, judgment, it always triggers up this first, the understanding of it from the now, oh, the judge in the court who passes legal judgments on the on people. Then this view automatically triggers off a defense that, oh, that one is not a judge. I'm not a judge. However, you don't really have to be a judge to pass judgments. No, you don't really have to be a judge in the court or a high court judge or a court judge to pass judgment. Now, let us examine the word judge as a verb. To judge is to assess a situation based on facts, knowledge, or presumptions to form or an opinion or conclusion that leads one to a decision or action. I'll repeat that again. The judge, in the verb sense of it, means to assess a particular situation based on facts you may have acquired, gathered, or knowledge you have previously, or you gathered it at the moment, or even your presumptions, it doesn't have to be correct, even your presumptions, and what this you gather them, you assess them, it helps you to form an opinion or conclusion about something that leads you to a decision or action. That is what the word judge is. So, for example, though he had no wristwatch, he was able to judge the time to be 3 p.m. Although John had no wristwatch on, he was able to judge the time to be 3 p.m. Now, what is that saying? Judge had no wristwatch, but Judge had some set of facts, maybe about the sun setting, maybe the time he left home and some presumptions about how long he must have spent where he is or maybe other facts on other factors he was able to put together to form his opinion or conclusion that the time must be 3 p.m. That is judgment. Whether that is correct or that is not correct, he's just passed a judgment. You often hear they say you can't judge a book by its cover. You can't judge a book by its cover. It's not saying, talking about the judges in the court, they're not there to judge books. Of course, you know that. So it's talking about the general, the everyday folks. You cannot judge a book by the cover. What that word is saying, you cannot, you know, um, what I call it, conclude on a thing by the face value, by what you see, by the outward. You need to dig deep. You need to understand more, get a fact about something. You don't just look at something without gathering information, without knowing what's the nitty gritty of what's involved and form an opinion and form a conclusion. So when you look at a book and say, oh, this book will be interesting because of the, the title, that's what he's saying. You only look at the title or the color of the book because of the color of the book, you feel this book is not going to be good. Or maybe because of the author or whatsoever. No, it goes beyond that. So don't judge a book by the cover. So that's exactly, that means when you do that, when you make that decision, you look at a book and say, this book will not be interesting or will be interesting. What is he saying? That you pass the judgment. It is saying you just passed a judgment. So you better understand it. So when I look at a book and say, oh, this book is good to read, I just passed the judgment. When I look at the book and say, this book will not be interesting or will be interesting, I just passed the judgment. Now, one, decision, to, when you make a decision to buy a cloth, for instance, you went to the store and you look at a certain cloth and you look at the cloth, you examine the cloth and you didn't like it, the shape, the color, based on what the facts you have or the assumptions maybe or the understanding, the knowledge you have about the, the, the maker, the designer of the clothes, you put all these things together and the price, you put all these things together, how much it costs and the price you saw it somewhere or saw some other thing somewhere and you look at all these, you put it together and you make a decision, I will buy or I will not buy. You just pass the judgment. That is judgment. You pass the judgment. Each time you tell your child, don't do that. What you did is wrong. You stop. You, you can't have any more soda. You have passed the judgment. You have put two and two together 
you have checked how many soda he has drank, you can't have any more soda. Or maybe your knowledge about what soda can do, or soda is not good for his health, you make that decision, you shouldn't have any more soda. Or soda, or what you did, is wrong. You're, you're passing judgment on your children. That's judgment. Each time you make a decision to take an action or not, you have passed the judgment. Even as simple as your alarm clock rings and you ah, you snooze the time and you turn on, it rings again, you snooze the time because you're, and you're thinking, well, should I get up and go to work or not? And you, you weigh the pros and the cons in your head quickly and you decide that it is better for you to go to work. And you get up against what you would have loved to do, sleep. Go and get ready, take a shower and drive off to work. You passed the judgment. It was a judgment you passed to make that decision. You've decided with the fact and opinion and knowledge you have that it is expedient for you to go to work, though it's not what you desire, but it is expedient for you to go to work. Every rational being or human being daily live by their judgments. I repeat again, every rational human being daily live by their judgments it's only a person who is cognitively who is cognitively impaired that don't or can't make judgments because he or she is not rationally capable of making judgments but for every rational being lives daily by his or her judgments now then the question number one wanted to treat is are true gospel preachers really guilty of passing or really guilty of the judgment passed on them by the hearers that they are being judgmental that don't judge are they really guilty of it the answer is a big yes a big yes because each time you tell someone that they need jesus in their lives you have assessed their life based on facts, your knowledge, and the presumption about them to form an opinion or draw a conclusion that they need Jesus, which led you to preach to them. This is what led you to the decision. Each time you tell someone that they need Jesus, or you go to preach to someone, that they need Jesus. It is because you have assessed their life based on the facts you've gathered or you could gather or you could say, your knowledge about that person or even your presumptions about that person and then have formed an opinion or have drawn a conclusion that they need Jesus. This is what led you to the decision to preach to them. You pass judgment. You are guilty. Guilty as charged that brings us to number two question have these true gospel preachers really done any wrong to their hearers the answer is a big no they have done no wrong to their hearers the irony of it all is that the hearers who said don't judge or you are being judgmental is also passing judgment against the preacher as he or she condemns him of judgment so each time you sell the preacher don't judge it means you are passing a judgment each time you've done that you've accused someone or each time you accuse someone of being judgmental you have assessed their speech their actions based on facts your knowledge and presumptions to form an opinion and draw a conclusion that the speaker is judging you. This is all rational acts. Each time someone, you tell someone, you're, you're being judgmental, you're judging me. Don't judge me. What you have done is to gather the facts you've, you know, around you or you've known before whatever facts you picked up from what the person is saying or his actions, you assessed it mentally by the knowledge you have and the presumptions you've already acquired in life or you acquired even at that time and the knowledge you've acquired at that time 
or knowledge you have before and you put two and two together and you wait and you form an opinion to draw you drew a conclusion that this man is judging me that this speaker is judging me that this preacher is judging me you also have passed judgment so you see you sit on the seat of judgment and you accuse and passing judgment and you're accusing someone else of passing judgment we are all rational beings and we live daily by judgment there is nothing wrong in judgment everything we do is judgment it's based on judgment all your actions is driven by your judgment about our situations they say don't judge a book by its cover it's not speaking to the judge in the court but to everyone because humans are rational beings that live daily through their judgments that's why he says don't judge a book by the cover because he knows you make daily judgments on everybody it wasn't talking to the court or to the judge in the court now the question is how should a preacher handle these judgments from the hearers so we understand it now that actually what the hearers passes to the preacher is judgments as well they are also judging the preacher while the preacher have judged them they are also judging the preacher judgments is going back and forth and we are arguing over who is judging who you are judging me and you know the whole thing goes like that now that you have understood that you are actually passing judgment as a preacher and know that you have done no wrong how should you respond to such accusations to such judgments in the field of evangelism there is no need to become defensive or go into damage control since you have done no damage but to accept what you have done period that is judge them based on facts your presumptions about them and your knowledge of god of god's word accept that's what i did you may be thinking that such response may or will be unfavorable to your mission however in actuality it opens up a portal to really share the gospel with such a one maybe thinking if i accept that oh i am judging you oh the hell is going to break loose it's everywhere is going to scatter and it we close my mission my mission is to preach to this person and that's why you get into damage control honey i'm not judging you you know you, you try to and that ends the gospel right there because now what you'll be debating about is talking about is i'm not judging you i'm judging you i'm not judging you and you will leave that place not preaching the gospel now what that you're being judgmental you're judging me what it does for you is that it opens up a door a, a door to preach the gospel to the to the hearer based on his term it's like that has become a conversation juggler that have led now to a portal to an entry point it has become another entry point a perfect entry point to preach the gospel to the hearer now here is my response most times when people I, I i encounter people like that in the field oh you're being judgmental i say yes i am being judgmental i know that i am judging you i say it and what happens they are chucked they don't they never heard it like that they are shut off they don't have any more defense because normally people say oh no i'm not judging you then they start accusing him you're judging me you're like this you're so once i hit that you see most of them you i get this chuck out from them because they never expect it that way and they're not expecting to hear it that way oh yes i admit it it's just like you got someone on line and you say yes i've got this person i think what he did this he did that he did that blah, blah. you did this you did this i expect that the person is going to lie say no yes i did it please forgive me you have nothing else to say but how do we resolve this matter but when the person started i saw you you did this i saw you why would you start bringing evidence to prove that he did it you see there's no need to prove anything anymore so now you cut off a whole lot of arguments and it opens up a portal for you to preach the gospel so when someone tells me that in the field of evangelism you're being judgmental I say, yes I, I am judging you i am being judgmental you're right however i am not 
judging you based on my judgments. I am only presenting the judgment of God to you based on my knowledge of the word of God. See, that is opening deep for me to preach the gospel. While the person is in shock, I am still saying, so just like the court, see, the, the judge sits in the court and judges people based on the law, not her judgment. She didn't write the law, but the law of the land, which she had knowledge about, and based on that, she passes accurate judgments, you know, on the people. In the same vein, I said, as a preacher, as a Christian, as a child of God, I am here only reading the judgment. The judge didn't write the law. I didn't write the law. I am not the one who actually passed the judgment on you. It is God. I'm only reading what God has said to you. And this is what God is saying. That God has said that there is no other thing that will judge you but his word. You see, that gives me opportunity again to open up the scriptures. Let me show you about the scriptures. Let me quickly show you. And you open up John chapter 12, verse 48. Now, why the person is in choker, you're preaching the gospel. It's another doorway to this gospel. Why is he still pondering? How do I handle you? John chapter 12, verse 48. I said, I read to you. He said, this is what God says. He said, he that rejects me, this is Jesus speaking, and receiveth not my word, hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So now, it's based on this law, this judgment that God has passed, Jesus has passed himself, saying that this is what I will judge you in the last day. I have knowledge and I can examine you, I, I can examine you by the word of God, not by my own thinking by my own knowledge and i've examined you by the word of god and i tell you if you don't comply to the word of god at the end of it this is the judgment the judgment is waiting for you the only difference is that god is not passing sentencing people at this hour he's not sentencing you now but you have from now till sentencing to appeal your judgment you have from now as you live, as long as you're living, till the last day. And we don't know when that last day is. It could be tomorrow. It could be tonight. It could be next year. It could be 50 years from now. We don't know. But God has given you, he has shown you what the judgment is, but he has not passed the sentencing yet. And that's what I'm trying to bring to you, to show you what God meant, God's judgment is already. And that gives you understand that you have the opportunity to appeal your judgment before it is too late and you have from now till the last day to appeal just like as a judge we pass a judgment and there will be time for sentencing so you are waiting this is a, you are just waiting for the sentencing but you can appeal your judgment now and the only way to appeal your judgment is to repent of your sins and turn from your ways and comply to the word of god now let me also show you by the scriptures same john uh, chapter 5 you know you you, you know the scriptures hand and she's open up the person is listening at this point sometimes not all but i'm going i'm going to come to such the person is listening at this point and uh you go to john chapter 5 verse 22 john 5 22 and it says for the father judgeth no man but hath committed all judgment unto the son this is jesus speaking he said god is judging no man but all the judgment has been given to Jesus. And he said that the judgment that I am going to judge you with is in my word. I've already passed through the judgment. You can look at it yourself and comply. That is appeal and change your ways. Or don't worry, you can wait till the last day. I already showed you what the judgment is and this judgment cannot change. At last day, you will face the consequences. So that's all I'm trying to do here, my sister. In the present or my brother and but some people as you were saying this they will throw in uh the question oh but the bible say when you show them the scriptures or show them the um, john chapter 12 verse 48 that god said that we not jesus said that we not judge you i've not come to judge you now but your the word will judge you in the last day 
They say, oh no, but Jesus said, don't, don't judge. Or the boy said, but God said, don't judge. I said, where? I asked them, please, where is it in the Bible? I assure you, 90% or even 95% of the people who say, don't judge, don't judge, don't know where this is in the Bible. They have no, so, no, is there, Jesus said, uh, they say, don't judge, they say, don't judge. I said, where is it in the Bible? Where? No, you don't know. Let me show you where it is in the Bible. You'll be the one to point them to where it is in the Bible. Yes, you say, don't judge. Yes, this is where it is in the Bible. This is where it stems up from the Bible. John, I mean, Matthew chapter 7, 1 to 5. But I will come to that. So, you have things under control. And he's listening. He wants to see where it is in the Bible. Let me show you where it says, don't judge in the Bible. So that you understand it yourself. So, I am not passing my judgment. I have no judgment to give you. Neither am I sentencing you that is condemning you. I'm only reading out to you the judgment of God, which will condemn you and I or justify you and I in the last day. And we all have from now to all the days of our lives to appeal this judgment, to change our ways, to turn to God so that our lives be transformed by the word of God. So this is what that awaits humanity when we die or in the last day. I said, this last day can be by rapture. This last day can be by death and death can come at any time and rapture can come at any happen at any time. So you see how you accepting that you are judging them opens up a great portal to the gospel. It didn't close the portal. It opens up the great portal. Then now that you've got his attention or her attention, and then you are in this place, then let's go to Matthew. You see, you are preaching the gospel. You are in control now because this person's argument or defense has ended right there and then when you say, yes, I am judging you. It has ended. Now what is left? Let's look at the gospel. Let's look at the Bible. Let's look at the Word of God and see what the Word of God says about judgment. So now, you take the person, let me show you the scripture that you are quoting or you don't know from where, from where that stems up, stems up. Don't judge. You're judging me. You're being judged. Let me show you from where it comes. Let us go to the scriptures. Then you take your hearer to the book of Matthew chapter 7. So I can give you understanding about these scriptures. Then you take your hearer to Matthew chapter 7, and then you read. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 to 5. Verse 1, it says, Judge not that ye be not judged. So then this is where it's coming from, verse 1. People pick verse 1 and wrong with it. But let me read the whole thing so you can get the literary context of that saying by Jesus. And you will understand whether Jesus is saying, don't judge. Now, this leads us to the topic or to this um, number four question. Did the Bible really say, thou shalt not judge? Did the Bible really say, thou shalt not judge? Let's examine by the scriptures. Yes, did the Bible really say thou shalt not judge? Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 5. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye met, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the moth that is in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in thy own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the moth out of thy eye, and behold, a beam is in thine eye? Thou hypocrite! Mark that word, thou hypocrite. First, what did he do? First, 
cast out the beam out of thine eye. Un, out of thine own eyes. And then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the moth out of thy brother's eye. You see, who has given these people this idea of Don George, this defense of Don George, is Satan. You see, I will explain it to you and I will, you know, we will look at it by the scriptures. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 to 6, it says that our weapons of warfare are not carnal, just paraphrasing, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down every imagination and every knowledge and thought that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. So you see what Satan, the Bible says, can you go to a strong man's house and plunder his goods without first binding the strong man? He said, when a strong man um, secures his goods, his goods is secured. And only a stronger than he can go there. But first of all, you have to what? Bind that strong man to be able to take his goods that are secured. So Satan has bound these people with thoughts and arguments that exalt itself above the knowledge of God. That's what you're dealing with. That's what's going on. So, and Satan has given them all these defensive thoughts and arguments. But they don't know it's Satan. They think they are being smart and being wise. But Satan has given them these defensive arguments or these thoughts they can use to defend themselves, which are actually flawed, are actually lies. So now, when the person says, don't judge, these are arguments and thoughts that exalt itself above the knowledge of God's word, trying to suppress the knowledge of God's word that it doesn't gain entrance into the hearer. Now, so what they do is the master um, craft of Satan, knowing how to twist God's word, using it as a pretext or as a proof text to support what he wants to do. It's normal about Satan. It's in his character. You saw it with Jesus, for the Lord said, He will give His angel, Matthew chapter 4, His angel charge over you when you jump from this mountain. Yes, did the Bible really say that? Yes, but not when you jump from the mountain. It's if something happens to you, God is able to send His angel to give His angel charge over you to protect you, that nothing happens to you. But you don't tempt the Lord, your God. So Jesus understood this. But Satan has cut off that text and uses it as a pretext or a proof text to support his claim that God will keep him if he jumps from there. Are you seeing that? So when you look at it, let's examine the book of Matthew, chapter 7. It says, Thou shalt not judge. Now, the judgment uh, the number one, which is the first thing, said, Thou shalt not judge. But they have cut off the first one and use it as a pretext or as a proof text to support their saying, Thou shalt not judge. But as we read this scripture now to understand more of the literary context, was it talking about that you should not judge at all? That's not what he's saying. He's never saying that you should not judge. But he says, if you want to be a judge, don't be a hypocrite. He knows we all pass judgment. Every day we live by judgment. He says, but don't be a hypocrite. First of all, ensure that if you're saying to your brother, you should not steal, that you are not a thief. If you're saying to your brother, you, are, you, you should not um, lie, that you are not a liar. If you're telling your brother or your sister that ungodly dressing will take him or her to hell. You should not be dressing ungodly. You should have taken care of yourself. And that is what Jesus also, the, the scriptures also say in that Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, in verse 6 of it, he said, and you'll be able to do this after your own obedience is complete. So you're going to be, be, going to be able to cast down every imagination that exalts itself above the knowledge of God's word 
only after your own obedience is complete. So your own obedience comes first. And that's what God is saying here. Now, to better understand scriptures all the time, sometimes, there is a literary context. You know, although most times people use these, all these theologians use these to, you know, uh, to defend drunk doctrines or uh, heresies or to, to do uh, mar the word of God or the, derail the word of God and the context, context, context. No, no. I don't want you to come with that mindset, but I want you to really understand that these are principles that really help someone who wants to know the Bible, who wants to know the truth of what the scriptures are saying, to really understand what the scripture says about a particular thing. To forget the abuse, let's look at the real thing now. Now, this Bible that was, you know, taken here, or the verse, verse 1 of chapter 7, judge not that ye be not judged. So because of that, judge not. Jesus said, don't judge. Jesus said, don't judge everywhere. Jesus said, don't judge. But when you read down the, um, the verse to verse 5, you understand what Jesus is saying. Do you understand the literary context behind that statement at number one? The first statement at verse one, don't judge, judge not. When you read that, you now understand the literary context. You understand that God is not saying, don't judge at all. But he's saying, correcting hypocrites. And then now, another way to get the meaning of a verse, you've seen the literary context. Usually literary context, you get them from the chapter. Before you read that chapter or the chapter behind or even the chapter in front. By the time you read two or three chapters, you're going to get the literary context of a scripture. Also in this verse, if you examine the historical context, this is which is dealing with who was Jesus talking to? Who was he preaching to? Where was he? What geographical locations? All those things, the demographics of what uh, the Sorens that the statement, it will give you insight also to what is really happening or why that statement was made and to understand the meaning of that statement. Just like someone can always take, cut off what you say and misinterpret it, but will not take the whole thing of what you say and say, he said, he will kill me, he said, he will kill me. But that's not what you say. You experience that all the time with human beings. That's what the devil do with the scriptures. That's what the devil do with the word of God. So when he's saying, don't judge, don't judge, did God say, don't really judge? So now we look at the historical context. Like I said, mark that word, hypocrite, thou hypocrite. Jesus, who was he talking about? This was the Sermon on the Mount. Started from chapter 5 and ended in chapter 7. In verse chapter 8, verse 1, Jesus came down from the mountain. At this point, the historical context, Jesus was speaking to the Jews, to the Pharisees who believe they know the law of God and condemn others who are Gentiles, condemn the Gentiles, you know, that they are not holy. And then the Pharisees condemn the ordinary Jew that they are not holy, they are not, they, are, they know the word of God, they are the one exempted. But if you read, go and take time and study the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5 to chapter 7, the entirety of it, you will understand who Jesus was, whom Jesus was dealing with and how Jesus was correcting them, reproving them because they were hypocrites. You know, condemning the Gentiles, condemning the layman Jew, but you are doing worse things than that. You are doing the same thing. Let me also show you the same thing. You understand it now. Let me show you the same thing that Paul encountered as he addressed the Romans. Now let us look at the book of Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, I read um, verses 1 to 3. Romans chapter 2, 1 to 3. And it says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest dost the same thing. This is exactly what Jesus was saying. Now here Paul is not saying don't judge, but he said, you that judge, remember that that you have judged. Make sure you are not caught up doing the same thing. You are not doing the same thing. Now, he said, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such thing. And that's what a preacher brings before the, 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 the hearer. Except you're going there to preach your own what you think. The way I always say, remove what you think and you're on what you assume from the word of God. It's not about what I think. There's no I think in it. What does the law say? Because that is the perfect judgment. Read God's judgment to the hearer. Let them understand what God has said 
about the hear, about the word. Let them understand what God has said. So read the word of God to your hearer. Explain to them the word according to sound biblical interpretation using the correct literary context, using the correct historical context, and using the correct biblical context, which is the most important thing. We'll come there. Now, he said, God's judgment is good. God's judgment is according to truth. It's correct, accurate, it's right. Against them that commit such things is those that commit sin that God's judgment comes upon. That God brings judgment, reviews the judgment, what did we do to them? And then we will come to that why most Christians or most people are always defensive. Let me just throw it in. Are always defensive when you bring the gospel because they are sinners. They have sin and sin is pleasurable. And people love sin and don't want to give up sin or maybe are not ready to give up sin yet. And then because of this, they become defensive and begin to accuse you are judging me because they want to defend the pleasure of sin that they are enjoying. That was stems that judgment. And because the master who has captured them, who they are in their bondage, who they don't know about, has given them thoughts and arguments that will you know, exalt itself against the knowledge of God. And they are using it and thinking they are doing themselves good. Now, you see what he's saying. Verse 3 said, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgeth them which do such things, that does the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Are you saying this? The problem. This is context here. Now, when you look at here and look at the historic, the literary context here, you understand what Paul is saying. He's not saying don't judge. You read it down and everywhere. You understand what God is saying. The whole of it, you understand that Paul is not saying don't judge, but he's saying why are you being a hypocrite in your judgment? Why are you lying and you're telling someone that you know, you're a liar, you're a liar, or lying will take you to hell, but you tell lies. You tell little, little lies. You tell big lies. You tell lies to defend yourself. You tell lies whenever when the need comes. But you, you go to preach and tell someone you should not lie. You're a preacher, you tell lying testimonies. But you go to tell someone if you lie, you go to hell. That's what Paul is saying. And who was Paul talking to? Who was he addressing, to, addressing here? He was the literal, come to the historical context again. He was addressing the Jews, you can see it. Who believe they know the law, but they are ignorant of the truth of God's law, of God's word. They are ignorant of the salvation of what God is doing. They read this law, but they don't understand that it is written of Jesus. And they understand the salvation of God in it. They have no clue. But they think they know. And they go out passing judgment on people who are even as guilty as they are. Who they are as guilty as they are. The same thing. Just like as you have all these half-baked Christians. They believe they are Christians because they are in church. They believe they are Christians because they said a prayer maybe some years ago and say, Jesus, come into my life because that they are Christians. Once saved, forever saved. And you see them going out to go and preach to others. Oh, you need Jesus. You need to accept Jesus. But they are the hypocrites the Bible is talking about. You are trying to tell someone they need Jesus, but what else? You need Jesus more than they do need Jesus. You need Jesus as well. You need to understand Jesus. That is what Paul was telling the Pharisees. You need to understand the scriptures. You need to understand you need God yourself. You need to know that you need God yourself. So, now, you see that that is relating to what Jesus is saying. So, Paul was speaking here in second, first, um, Romans chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, saying exactly what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse, verses 1 to 5. It's the same thing. Now, the big thing about understanding the scriptures, the biggest, the most important thing about it all, in understanding what the scripture says, is the biblical context. The biblical context. Now, historical context has to play a little low role in understanding what the Bible is saying. But it's not the ultimate. Literary context has to play a little role in understanding the scripture, but it's not the ultimate. But most times, all these theologians, and most times all these people that twist the word of God to for their gains, or that Satan has raised as agent to the destruction of others, they major in literary context and historical context. This is majoring on minor because they want to create confusion or they are carnal and they are being used by satan to 
twat the truth of God's gospel. So the measure in this minus literary context and historical context, oh, let's look at the context, the history, and they use that to, to be talking carnally about the word of God and forgetting that the Bible is a spiritual book. What that takes the weight in biblical truth, in understanding the Bible, in rightfully dividing the word of truth, in rightfully understanding the scripture, is the biblical context. The literary context may not give you the meaning. The historical context may not give you total understanding of what a particular scripture, what God is saying in a particular verse or chapter or in a particular message in the scriptures. However, the biblical context is what that gives you the insight and total truth of the word of God. And being able to understand how to use the biblical context, you will never wrongly interpret the scriptures or allow anybody to intimidate you or anyone be able to intimidate you on the truth of the scriptures. However, time will not permit us today to look into the literary context, oh, no, sorry, the biblical context, because that is huge in treating this topic, thou child of judge. That is huge in totally understanding it, what it actually means, thou child of judge. So I'm going to leave it at this for today, and there will be a part two. So in this, we have understood that, yes, every rational human being, daily live by their judgments. And there is no rational human being that don't make judgment every day. All you do is based on judgments. And judgment is just the ability to assess a particular situation based on facts and knowledge or even your presumptions that you have acquired about a particular thing, about a particular situation, and draw an opinion or a conclusion that leads you to take your decisions or take actions. That is judgment. That is pattern judgment. And we all do this every day. And it's not a sin. It's not wrong. It's not morally wrong. It's not wrong at any capacity to pass judgment. That is who we are, a rational being. However, the devil has twisted what that which is good and using it for as a pretext for evil to defend those in his captivity so that they do not break free from the hands of the devil. And that is what the Bible is saying. Let us go to that second Corinthians as I wrap up with this because it has appeared so much in this discussion. Let's look at it so you understand what the devil is saying. And that's why God tells us that our weapons of warfare are not carnal, which means, preacher man, pray against such arguments. Pray against such things as you go into the field. Contend with them spiritually, because this is the works of Satan. This is the bondage of Satan, the strong man that he uses to guard against his goods. It says, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I read from verses 4, to six. He said, for our weapons of warfare are not carnal, they are not carnal things, but are mighty, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Those as those arguments are strongholds that Satan have used to bind those that are in his captivity, those that are in his bondage. Those are strongholds, those arguments. Now listen, what are those strongholds? Casting down every stronghold. Now, what are those strongholds? Casting down now, pulling down every stronghold. Now, the Bible goes for in verse 5 to explain what the strongholds are. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This is what you will arrest in prayer. It is knowledge. God has, Satan has given them the knowledge. Thou shalt not judge, and they are using it everywhere as a pretext to destroy the word of God. And imagination, this is the imagination of their hearts, that you are judging them. And Satan has, you know, he's being judgmental. It's the imagination of their heart. The Bible says we should cast them down in place of prayers 
as you go into the field of evangelism or before you go into the field of evangelism. Cast them down. And then don't give up. Don't give up on the person because of this. Accept that there is nothing wrong in personal judgment. You understood that as a rational being, as a preacher, before you go to preach to someone, it's because you pass the judgment on that person. It's not a bad thing to pass judgment. We live by judgments. It is your as it is you assessing his lifestyle, assessing this person based on facts and knowledge you have, or even your presumptions about the person. And this led you to draw an opinion or to arrive at the conclusion that led you to the decision to go and preach to them that they need Jesus. It was judgment you passed. And there is nothing wrong with that. It's normal about any cognitive human being. It's only the, 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 the impaired, the cognitively impaired that can't do such things, that don't have the capacity to do such a thing. And there is no need to be defensive. There is no need to start be doing damage control. You've done no damage. Accept it. Yes, I am judging you. But this is the judgment I'm passing to you. It's the judgment of God. Now, this is goes to you, the preacher, so that you don't become those that Jesus was telling or Paul was telling um, you that judge, judge another, will you not be judged? Will you escape the judgment of God? Now in verse 6, he said, having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is complete. That is the key thing. Don't be a hypocrite, preacher man. You that saying you need Jesus, are you still sinning? Is Jesus a minister of sin? Are you still committing immoral, sexual immoral? Do you still watch pornography? Do you still masturbate? Do you still commit uh, sexual immoral acts? Do you still lie? Do you still steal? You still, you have anger, you have malice, you have bitterness, you have backbiting, you gossip. Do you still have these things with you? The Bible says if you fail at one point of the law, you will fail in all. When you fail in line, you are a transgressor of the law. Even if you are not stealing, the one who steals is a transgressor of the law. You are guilty of the same offense. You are sinners. You've transgressed the law for sin is transgression against the Lord of God. First John chapter 3, verse 4. So you're guilty of the same thing. Two, so, the most important thing about this is that as you go to preach, preach a man, preach a woman, ensure that you are not a hypocrite. Ensure that the person you're telling they need Christ, that you yourself is truly working with Christ, that Christ is really in you, that you are really abiding in Christ. As Jesus says, if you abide in me and I in you, then you will be a much fruit. So ensure that you are really abiding in Christ. That is where the whole thing matters. So next time when we meet in part two, we are going to be talking about did the Bible really say thou shalt not judge? Part two. Examining the topic. Did the Bible really say thou shalt not judge? Part two. Then we are going to focus more on the biblical context and you will understand what that means and how to better interpret the scripture and understand this saying thou shalt not judge and then you can judge for yourself and see whether actually the bible has said thou shalt not judge and that will put the rest to that argument and bless the work of the lord you're doing in your heart and for you we break the defense of satan against your life and you open up your heart to the gospel and receive jesus that you may live May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May these little words you've heard today, may they prosper in your life and yield fruit even unto a hundredfold in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Till we meet again, God bless you. Bye for now. Hurimo is a non-denominational ministry given to the propagation of God's righteousness and holiness in churches and nations of the world through crusades, revival meetings, conferences, and the production and spread of holiness literature and materials. Pastor Paul Ricke has been mandated to raise up this great work as the international director, an anointed teacher of holiness with divine inspiration. He is the author of over 30 Christian books and many hundreds of recorded messages that can be found on the YouTube channel. Connect with us on YouTube and Facebook. Holiness Revival Movement Worldwide Horimo is promoting biblical truth, righteousness, and holiness. Please join us every Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time with the Zoom meeting ID 425-964-7780 or every Monday at 10 p.m. Eastern Time ID 989-988-2681. To hear the undiluted word of God from Pastor Paul Ricker.
the international director of Horimo. The address of Horimo North America is 3776 Piney Mountain Road, Walnut Cove, North Carolina, 27052. You can telephone us on 336-251-4626 or email us at horimona at gmail.com. You can also visit the website at www.horimona.org. Welcome to Holiness Revival Movement, promoting holiness and righteousness worldwide.